I'd like to welcome you all to the Citizens Online Mayoral Hustings, which will start shortly and run till around 8pm. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Um, please note that for logistical and legal reasons, this will be purely a viewing experience for the audience. Um, the Hustings is chaired by Lauren Tobias, the Chief Executive of Volunteer Centre Hackney, who has herself kindly volunteered her time and will be putting your questions to the candidates. Um, we've taken questions on six topics, transport, community safety, health, children and young people, housing and finance. Uh, and we've chosen a mix of questions with candidates given two minutes each to answer and we'll get through as many as we can in the 90 minutes. Um, so the candidates are in alphabetical order by surname, uh, Helen Baxter for the Liberal Democrats, uh, Zoe Garbett for the Green Party, Philip Glanville for Labour and Cooperative Party, Oliver Hall for the Conservative Party and Gwenton Slowly for Hackney People Before Profit. Uh, the candidates will answer the first question alphabetically and the order will then be rotated for every question thereafter. Uh, once again, thank you for taking part in the hustings. We hope you find it interesting and informative. Um, without further ado, I will hand over to, to Lauren Tobias, the hustings chair. Uh, Lauren. Okay, thank you. All right, well, we can launch straight in. Uh, I'm going to ask Helen Baxter from the Liberal Democrats to start off with the first answer. And this first question will be about housing. So a significant number of council homes have been lost in the last decade and most residents are not in the financial position to buy or even rent a home on the market. What would you do as mayor to solve this urgent housing crisis in the borough? And how would you secure the necessary funds? Thank you. Well, one of Hackney's strengths is the diversity of its communities. And it's absolutely tragic that some people can't afford to stay in the borough and are being priced out, as, as you've described. Um, obviously, it's... Um, it costs money to build council homes and so there, there has to be a balance with with striking a bargain with developers to build some affordable homes as as well as those those private ones but um currently affordable homes are anything but so what i would do is is strike a harder bargain with those developers um ensuring that we're increasing the number of, of council homes for hackney it's absolutely crucial um that we do this and in terms of funding it's about priorities um, the, the council has a big budget, um, but building more council homes would absolutely be one of my priorities. All right, thank you. So we can move on to Zoe Garbett from the Green Party. Thanks, Soren, and thank you for this question. And this is a really important issue and something we hear on the doorstep all the time. And what I hear regularly from the residents on Rhodes Estate, where I chair the Tenants and Residents Association, we, yeah, we're seeing a huge breakdown and separation of communities and families due to the overdevelopment in Hackney. And I would absolutely stand up to developers. I think that we should be challenging, um, yeah, to, to the anti we're a strong anti-gentrification party and um, I'm strongly opposed to the overdevelopment in the borough. There's other ways that we can bring in finance to fund uh, the homes that we need. Other boroughs around, Hack uh, around London are uh, using their... Um, borrowing to build homes or using looking at pension funds to invest in building the homes we need we'd also look at i'd also look at using the, um built, bringing empty property back into use um i absolutely support the calls and of um being a, a really keen and um active member of uh, morning lane people's space who are calling for at least 50 percent um social housing in the development of morning lane um so we and people were calling a couple of weeks ago for 100 percent in any developments. And it's absolutely those groups that we need to be listening to because the impact of um, not providing these homes is to lose what we love about Hackney. Thank you. All right. We can move on to Philip Glanville from Labour and Cooperative Party. Thanks, Lauren. Um, it's a really, really important question. And it's not a surprise to me that housing is the number one issue here at the Hustings. A little bit about my record uh, on council house building. Um, I was a really proud cabinet member for housing as we started that journey to starting to build council housing again. We must never forget the failures of Tory and Labour uh, administrations up until 2009, basically tying councils, um, both hands behind their back to stop them building council housing. And we had to just rely on the planning process, housing associations and others. So getting Hackney back into the business of building its own council housing and making sure it's genuinely affordable and available to local people is something that got me into politics, um, has definitely given me the zeal 
that I have as mayor. We've built about 1,300 genuinely affordable homes with our, our partners since I've become mayor. That's council housing, social rent from housing association, shared ownership, Hackney living rent, uh, and other types of housing. All of them focused, though, on what local residents uh, need here in Hackney and keeping communities together. Uh, in my manifesto that we launched last night, we've got a commitment to build a thousand new council homes for social rent over the next four years. That's effectively a doubling of what we have been building over the last four years. And it's really important to me that we allocate those homes to the most in need uh, here in the borough. Um, I'm really excited about a conversation with Hackney residents about where those homes are. Some of them are part of existing programmes. They'll be familiar to local residents on estates. Others are going to be new. They may be involved cool. morning uh, lane uh, as well. I don't just want to respond, though, to the council housing part of this uh, dilemma because of a 34,000 residents in the private rented sector. We need a fair deal for them. Uh, we need more affordable home ownership options in the borough. Shared ownership isn't going to just be uh, enough to keep our communities together. But I come back to council homes for local residents. And if you vote Labour, you'll get that. There's a real problem with some of the other political parties. That's that... two minutes, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we can move on to Oliver Hall, Conservative Party. Thanks, Lauren. So I think that there are some really important points that the other candidates have made already. Um, we absolutely need to stand up to developers. And I think that that's somewhere that the, the current council uh, has fallen down, really. I don't think that they're strong enough with developers and I don't think they're strong enough with supporting people already in council flats. When I go out to speak to people, I have the same experience as the other candidates. This is the number one issue that people are talking about. Um, they're unhappy with the way that the local council are running things. They're unhappy with the way that the hacking, which was 18 months ago, and the council have failed now uh, still to bring uh, systems back online. They're unhappy with the slowness of housing benefit. Um, and the fact that there are vacant properties in Hackney, vacant council properties in Hackney that aren't being utilised because of the hacking. Um, one case, I was out with uh, one of our councillors, Councillor Steinberger, um, in one block, there was a family who wanted to move from a three bed to a one bed flat. Uh, and in that same block, there was another family who wanted to move uh, from a one bed to a three bed flat. Now they both applied to the council uh, to swap properties. Um, and the council said, oh, we can't match anyone. We haven't got those, that data because of the hacking. Now, fortunately, Councillor Steinberger was able to intervene there, but it shouldn't take your local councillor having to intervene for the systems to work. And it shouldn't be taking 18 months for the council to get back on track. We need leadership in this borough that actually focuses on the people and focuses on doing more to support people. Um, so seconds to go. There's another, you know, we need to look after the people who are already in council flats. I've already discussed that. But I think that there's a point about maintenance in council flats. We met one woman who, who's been waiting six months for the council to repair her ceiling after it fell in because of damp. Now, that simply isn't good enough. And if you vote Conservative, then you're going to get someone who actually cares rather than someone who's there to replace Diane Abbott or Meg Hillier as the MP. OK, thank you, Oliver. All right, we move on to Gwenton Slowly from the Happy People Before Profit Party. And that's exactly what we believe in, put the people first. Uh, first and foremost, we need to be transparent with the people in the local area. As someone that has grown up in social housing and seeing the impacts and the benefits, negative and positive, of having a community that knows each other, that feels like they are a community, instead of having gentrification, or as I said, ethnic cleansing of, of, of some of the residents within the borough who are feeling as if their voice are not being heard. And for me, we look at where we are now, Phil's been in post for how many years, and uh, we understand he, he's tried his best, but when you're not an independent party, there's certain things that you're restricted to actually saying and you have to toe the party line. And this is one of the reasons why I've decided to run under the banner of people before profit, because if we look at affordable housing, who is it affordable to? And what if someone's on benefits? I've got a family, uh, a young lady where she's got three young children in the house. She's currently having treatment for cancer. And she's been struggling to get housed in Acme. 
And this has been going on for four years. And it's the same thing that what Oliver said is you raise concerns and it falls on deaf ears or there's some sort of excuse that why it can't be done. So we need to move forward and learn from uh, the bad practices such as being hacked and being held to ransom. 30 seconds to go. And, and move forward. We need, first of all, to protect our data system and keep the conversation going in real time and actually explain to the people in the community what it means when you say affordable housing, affordable to who. Thank you. Okay, thanks to all the candidates. All right, so we'll move on to the next question, which is around children and young people, community safety. Considering the child Q scandal, what would you do as mayor to hold the local education system to account as much as the police? And we'll start off with Zoe Garbett from the Green Party. Yeah, so this is an absolutely horrifying case. Um, and we're, I'm sort of personally really upset by hearing about this experience of Child Q. Um, we publicly made a statement on behalf of the Green Party with the Greens of Colour and the Drug Policy Working Group stating our outrage at the failures on the, from the authorities to safeguard this young person. Um, and that's absolutely what I would do with the, the authorities, speak about this um, taking a safeguarding first approach and making sure that that's integral to, you know, in everything that we do. And also challenging the racism that was highlighted by the safeguarding report by, you know, by all the, by all the authorities and make sure that that was being systematically addressed in all of the authorities. So that's the education authorities as well as the police. So making sure that those involved were held accountable, but making sure that all of our schools are not going to fall, um, you know, this isn't going to happen in any of our schools and that all of our children are safe. Um, hearing young people speak out at the um, protests around how they feel unsafe in schools was really really quite sad. Um, I've, I've listened to a um, Hackney, Hackney account and worked with them on how they say that young black and brown children feel unsafe on our streets and now we know they feel unsafe in our schools. We've called for the resignation of the borough commander or for the borough commander to be dismissed. We called that quite loudly, supporting the calls from Coffee Afrique and Sister Space. Um, so I'd work with those... So I'd work with those um, organisations as well as listening to young people. Um, I recently went, met with... Um, the youth parliament as well. So working with those groups to really understand young people's experiences and make those places safe, safe for them. Thank you, Zoe. Okay, move on to Philip Glanville, Labour and Cooperative. Thanks, Lauren. I think all of us, uh, as Zoe said, have, were disgusted by what happened to Child Q. Um, and I'm really proud that the council was part of the safeguarding process that sponsored the independent report because without that report we wouldn't have that really clear and stark evidence not only of what happened to child q but the wider issues of adultification and racism and uh, let's be clear it's not unconscious bias it's bias uh, in our education and policing system holding the police to account holding the education system to account is why i was at both uh, the protests uh, a couple of weeks ago both outside stoke and town hall and speaking uh, so outside Stoke Newington Police Station, outside the town hall. And it was really clear from residents that they wanted to see a response on the education system. They wanted their voice heard. And while we've been doing a lot to improve our education system, uh, I think we need to do uh, a lot more. So we've had uh, a policy of no need to exclude. We've got a really good record of working with our primary schools to uh, reduce exclusions to zero in our primary schools. But there is still too many exclusions in our secondary schools. And when we're talking about exclusions in our secondary schools, black boys and black girls are much more likely to be uh, excluded. Um, we have been uh, working with our scrutiny process to have uh, an independent look at those issues and what happens after exclusion as well. So making sure that uh, the support services, people referral units, some of our partners are as good as they can be and investing more in, uh, in that work. Um, but fundamentally, we need a system where our schools are accountable to the council, the community, to parents and young people. And we've got a national government that wants to move those schools even further away. Uh, and we need to have that accountability, whether it's a maintained school, a faith school, a free school or an academy, to see that system's leadership and make sure that our schools are truly anti-racist and the parent and child voice 
is at the heart of our education system. And that's what I'll be determined to do if we're elected as mayor. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. All right, move on to Oliver Hall from the Conservative Party. Thank you. I think that, you know, well, I was horrified as, as anyone else was, as everyone else was, by uh, the reports around Child Q. Um, it's clear that there were multiple failings across the spectrum, whether it be the police, whether it be the teachers, whether it be designated safeguarding leads within the school who, who really failed to protect this student. Um, it, it's, clear that, it's clear that we need to do more with ra on racism, uh, whether it be in education, whether it be in the police. Um, I recognise what the mayor said about um, about the Met's own report. I, I read that report. I issued a statement as well. Um, we both agree that the, the Met's report didn't go far enough in accepting wrongdoing um, and accepting that change needs to happen. Uh, they were forced to act because of a massive, overwhelming public voice and not because they felt that they really had to uh, within themselves. They didn't read that report and say something has to change within them, within us as an organisation, within the Met Police. What they read it as was, oh, right, well, this has happened. Let's wait and to see what the people say. And only when there were protests did the police actually come out and uh, give a response. So I think that we whether it's the mayor of Hackney, whether it's the mayor of London, whether it's the next uh, commissioner for the Metropolitan Police, more has to be done um, with policing, more has to be done in the education sector. Um, and, you know, we've offered our support to the council and we, if we're elected, uh, the Conservatives will continue go. that work um, for the next four years as well. Okay. Thank you, Oliver. All right, move on to Gwenton Slowly from Hackney, People Before Profit. As one of the founders of the London Gang Exit, which was founded in Hackney in partnership with a housing association on King Edwards Road called Sheehan Housing, was we founded that programme so we could move people out in real time that was facing risk. And we also delivered training. Funnily enough, I've met with the police and also contacted the school offering support. And although everyone's in the mindset of uh, getting rid of the borough commander, I look at it as the borough commander also agrees that uh, no young person should, should be searched without an appropriate adult. So if he's actually taking that standpoint, I think that we should actually work with him to try and, and get things done properly. We need to understand there's processes and systems. Once an investigation is launched, it's then taken away from the borough commander and it then goes to central. So there's not much more he could do from where he's sitting, it, it, it's above him. When we look at systemic racism and unconscious bias, this isn't something that has just come about. I, I went to school in Hackney, primary school, secondary school, and nearly lost my life on my 19th birthday, just being in Lower Clapton in the wrong place at the wrong time, I ended up getting shot. And we need to look at that. Has anything changed from some nearly 30 years ago? Nothing, nothing has really changed because a lot of the time, people don't understand the grassroots issue of why these things are happening. And, and we were making excuses that... 30 seconds to go. It, it's an academy. Whether it's an academy, faith school, whatever school it is, they should all be falling in line with the same governance and safeguarding. And no young person should be strip searched ever again without an adult of it. Thanks very much, Quentin. Okay, we'll move on to Helen Barrett. From Liberal Democrats. The case of Child Q is, is horrifying, absolutely horrifying. Um, it, it's it's partic particularly horrific and I, I was shocked when I heard, but I'm afraid it's the latest in the long line of examples of racism, sexism, discrimination in institutions that people should be able to trust, um, whether it's the police, whether it's schools. Um, uh, in terms of the police, we called immediately for the borough commander to resign. In terms of the school, there was a serious failure of safeguarding there. How, how, on, earth, how on earth could that, could that happen? Um, something has gone very wrong in their safeguarding obligations as a school. Um, in terms of holding, holding them to account and in terms of moving forward, as mayor, you have the platform to bring people together um, to, to create outreach programmes between the police and the com and communities where there's a huge amount of mistrust, understandably, um, to talk about issues like adultification where young black children are being treated like adults. Um, and I think as mayor, you have the unique platform to bring people together, get them in the room and discuss these issues with people looking at each other face to face, 
talking to each other as equals. And that's what I would do as mayor. Thanks, Helen. All right, we'll move on to the third question, which is around the lovely topic of LTNs. So LTNs are affecting some people more than others and have proved to be one of the most divisive issues the borough has ever seen. We know lifestyles will have to change in light of the climate emergency. Do you have a better plan and how would you get people on board? And we're starting with Philip Lanville, Labour and Cooperative. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you for the question. And clearly LTNs have been really controversial, but they've never been the only tool that we've used in Hackney to improve active and sustainable transport. And uh, I'm really passionate about the contribution that changing our roads around schools, around school streets can contribute to uh, improving air quality and improving active travel around our schools. And we have 48 fantastic school streets in Hackney. That's the largest number of any borough uh, in London uh, and I think in, in, in the country. Uh, we've introduced new low traffic neighbourhoods, we've introduced uh, junction protections, we've introduced our new LTNs, we've improved cycle parking, we've invested in public transport, we've fought bus cuts when they've been uh, and come up with alternative solutions and we've continued to invest in all of the infrastructure that makes active travel uh, better, whether that is protecting our pavements, whether that is uh, introducing the new Hackney Central Station, investing in Hackney Wick, Overground Station, campaigning to make sure that all of those stations are, are staffed. So for me, it is about having a sustainable transport policy that has climate change, air quality, public transport at its heart. We've always promoted the pedestrian, the cyclist, the bus user and disabled residents uh, first in our work. I think there's more work to do, as you'll see in our manifesto, around supporting how disabled residents get around our borough and making sure that they feel that their priorities are being heard. We all need to reduce the seconds. private motor car for uh, journeys that are unnecessary. We need to support our businesses though. So just transition is really important to me. So we're going to invest in new bike uh, hangers. We're going to invest in an e-cargo bike network, not just in some parts of the borough, 1,500 EV chargers and really working with business and our communities to make sure no one is left behind, that social justice is at the heart of our transport policy and that is the record that we'll be building on uh, in the new manifesto if I'm re-elected uh, as mayor. Thank you. All right, move on to Oliver Hall from the Conservatives. Thank you. If anyone knows anything about my campaign, then they'll know that this is a main issue of it. Um, I think it's firstly important to note that people in Hackney don't drive because they want to, they drive because they have to. Um, there are sometimes, for some people, no alternative, there is no alternative than driving. And it's important that the council recognises that. It's important that the council and mayor understand and listen. There are far too many people who are still waiting for exemption because they've got a blue badge. Uh, far too many people um, trying to speak to the council. There was someone I was speaking to who had waited three weeks to, uh, for an ex uh, exemption after an LTN went in in their area. They aren't working. They just aren't working. And it's all well and good for, um, for the mayor to say that uh, they're, they're listening, they want to understand these issues and all of that. But actually, when they held consultations uh, time and time again, um, the majority of people said no to LTNs. Uh, in Hoxton West, 64% of people said no to LTNs. Um, in De Beauvoir, 62% of people said no to LTNs. In Homerton, 57% said no to LTNs. And in Victoria Park, 56% said no to LTNs. And yet the council pushed it through. So what we need is a council and a mayor who listen, who understand, and who actually care about the response they get, rather than forcing it through. Now, Labour has the numbers at the moment. If you want to see change, if you want to be listened to, then don't vote Labour, because all they're going to do is stay in power as they have for the, re for the last 50 years, and they're not going to listen. They have got no incentive to listen unless you seconds to go. So I think, it's, I think it's very clear. People don't like LTNs, and those who don't like LTNs need an alternative, and that alternative is me. I've been working with LTN campaigners for the last year, uh, to try and get rid of them, to our best to oppose them. I know that our Conservative councillors have been doing the same for the last uh, two years in council, uh, and it's time that we had a mayor and a council that listened. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to Gwenton Slowly from Hackney People Before Profit. 
Yeah, as someone that's worked closely with uh, Rover, a lady from Lewisham who actually lost her daughter to air pollution down in the Deptford area, this is something that we're very passionate about and share the concerns as with our party friends from the Green Party. And for me, looking at the LTNs again, it comes back down to where they are actually placed and who actually lives there. If we look at places like the bottom of Amherst Road going back onto Leebridge Road, it's becoming mini dual carriageways outside some people's homes. So how do we then determine who lives and who dies by placing these things uh, strategically in, in front of some people's homes? And I think that's where we need to revisit this and actually, as Oliver said, listen to the people's voices because a lot of the people that I've met are opposing to this. So when we're saying we're going to put the people that uh, for the LTNs first, there's a whole demographic and margin of people that have not been heard. And we can't have a mayor in, in post where he then decides who lives, who dies, and who he listens to. It's just not acceptable. Because if I'm not able to live off the main road, then that means that my life and my lungs are at risk. And not a lot of people could live away from where these LTNs are. And I think it's, it's like a draw of the lottery, whether you live or die. So we're going to put some LTNs in front of your house and we're not going to listen to your voice. And if you die, if we look at the stats of the amount of people that have come back with uh, effects of, of lungs, where these LTNs are, then we should be transparent with the public and then say these are the effects of having LTNs and mini dual carriageways outside people's homes. Thank you. We'll move on to Helen Baxter from the Liberal Democrats. The mayor mentions that LTNs are not the only tool that the council's used um, in this area. But if you speak to the average person in Hackney, knocking on doors, canvassing, this is one of the first issues that comes up. This is the policy that everyone has heard of. Um, and I can't think of a policy that's been so divisive in, in, in a long time. Um, I think the reason it's been divisive is the way it was implemented. Even when consultations are carried out, people have the feeling that the council's made up its mind already and isn't really interested in what people have to say. Um, and it's become a debate where the loudest voices are heard, and that's a very, very extreme, extreme um, opinions. We believe that LTNs can work. Um, what I would do as mayor is put in proper monitoring, monitoring of air quality, of traffic on, on the roads that are of course, some roads are affected because traffic is pushed onto them and a lot of people live on main roads. So the key is to monitor monitor what's going on there um, and if required um, to make changes, not, not to be wedded to an ideological position as the mayor and the council is, but to, to, be, to be willing to learn from the evidence and make changes where required. Of course, it's not all about cars. The majority of people in Hackney don't drive. There are other other issues that we need to focus on in terms of improving air quality and making our borough greener. One of my focuses would be on cycling and making cycling possible for, for cyclists of all abilities, not just the young and the fit, but, but cycling for all with them, more inclusive cycle pathways. Thank you. And finally, uh, Zoe Garbett from the Green Party. Thanks for this. Um, so, as the Green Party, we are absolutely committed to taking urgent action on the climate crisis and the, the way we move around the borough is a key part of that. And I'm absolutely committed in my first term to reduce traffic by 40 percent because this is about, <clears throat> as Oliver said, some people do need to use their car, but it's making sure that those that don't need to are able to use other modes of transport. So we absolutely support bus priority, freeing the bus love the campaign hashtag free the bus and making sure the buses can move around our borough so that people are able to use buses absolutely taking action so that people can cycle so phil i'm really glad that you said you're going to sort out the backlog of cycling storage because we've been waiting for almost a year on our estate and people have told me across the borough that they can't store their bike in the house or their bikes get stolen so providing that so i would absolutely address that as a priority I also am committed to making sure that people are upskilled to be able to fix their own bikes. I volunteer at the Zoom Bike Project in Gillette Square every week, where we're supporting families to learn those skills to fix their, you know, pump up a tyre and have that confidence and giving children those skills to kind of be confident in their own kind of bike and bike management so that we're, you know, learning those skills. We also kind of swap bikes so they've got those bikes for life. Um, we want to support businesses to use cargo bikes. We also, yeah, what we also want people to be moving away from electric cars. Um, 
in so with a green mare you would never pay more to park a bike than you would a park a car we we think you know obviously electric cars are parts of parts of the solution but they're only accessible to people that can afford them and um they okay. thanks and they also cause they also also cause accidents so if this is about a safe healthy streets we need to look at all of those different options available making our streets kind of walkable and wheelable and decluttering our pavements we've listened to the calls from mums mums for lungs uh, living streets ramblers and how we can work together to deliver this vision so yeah really passionate about this and to, to reducing traffic for, and improving air quality for everyone across the borough thank you so you can build on uh, your answer to the previous question because we're moving on to another environment question. Uh, so what else would you do to decarbonise the borough? And this time we're starting with Oliver Hall from the Conservative Party. Thanks. So I think there's, the, there's something that we, we all recognise and that is that actually there does need to be an, alter, an alternative to driving for those who don't need to drive. Um, so the first thing I would do is lobby City Hall uh, to get back these uh, bus services, which are going to be lost, um, it's all well and good for the mayor to, to for the um, mayor of Hackney to sit there and say, "Oh well, we're we're against the loss of these services," uh, but at the same time as saying that he's against these loss of services, he's out there uh, with the mayor of London, who's pushing through these losses, um, support him and talking about how great a job he's doing for London. So actually what we need is someone who really takes City Hall to task on this and that's what I would do. Um, I, I use the bus, I, I don't drive myself, I don't have a driving licence, I cycle where I can um, but it's important that when we have cycle lanes that they're well maintained. Uh, all too often uh, I see cyclists and myself having to leave the cycle lane because it's got potholes on it. Um, sometimes there aren't any uh, cycle lanes um, and you end up dry, uh, riding along a potholed road, which is, of course, more dangerous on a bike than in a car. Um, so we need to be really, uh, really clear that we want an alternative. Um, there is another thing as well, which is that uh, I've said that I'll get rid of LTNs. Um, but right now, what the mayor should be doing is even if he wants to keep LTNs, he should be making them uh, making electric vehicles exempt to make that trans transition uh, easier for people uh, and more ent enticing. Look, I recognise the cost of electric cars, I really do, but there are things like uh, car share, um, there are sort of uh, pay by minute car services Five around seconds. Hackney uh, using electric vehicles. And actually, there's no point to driving an electric vehicle um, if you're not going to get any benefit from that in terms of being able to go through an LTN um, because if you're just sitting in traffic, it's just like any other car. Um, so we, we need to be far more brave about taking on City Hall and we need to be far more brave about giving people an option. Thank you. I will move on to Gwenton Slowly from the Hackney People Before Profit. I think we need to reinvest some of those millions that have been earned from the LTNs and these parking cameras in Hackney as an incentive for people to actually change their cars to something that is more efficient and, and friendly. When we look at the charging ports for these electric cars, depending on where you are, you will struggle to charge your cars. What they actually sell on the booklet, saying the car will last two or three hours. A lot of the time, when you look, it's not the amount of mileage that you actually get in from your car. I myself had to downgrade to a smaller car where it cuts off once you stop in traffic. And I think if we raise more awareness around that and the benefits of buying a car, and most of the new model cars now, just to let you know, they actually turn off once you stop at the traffic light or in traffic so it doesn't continue polluting uh, the air around you. We need to also look at other resources of how we're going to help clear the pollution. Because if we're doing all we can in Hackney, this needs to be a larger conversation with neighbouring boroughs such as Haringey, where I drive through Haringey and I struggle to see LTNs. We look at Tower Hamlets and other neighbouring boroughs. That pollution from those neighbouring boroughs are not just going to stop on the border of Hackney. 
because we've got LTNs, the pollution is going to come over. So it needs to be a citywide conversation when it comes to tax pollution. Thank you. Thank you, Blinken. Okay, Helen Baxter, please, from the Liberal Democrats. I absolutely agree with Gwenton that we need to work with neighbouring boroughs. We have to have a joined up approach. Um, it's no good traffic just being pushed on, onto the main arteries if, if all boroughs have to work together because we, we're all living in the same city. Um, also, in terms of cars, we would increase the charges for households that have a second or a third car. But as we know, only 30% of people in Hackney do own a car. So um, it's important that, as I said before, we invest in, um, in cycling and in, in improving cycle pathways so that all cyclists can use them. Um, better signposting, creating cycling neighbourhoods or cycling areas so people know that they can, they'll have a pleasant journey through a particular area and they won't suddenly be caught out. Um, cycling storage, we've already talked about the two-year waiting list. Um, that's that's an easy fix that prohibits people that want to cycle but but can't because they have to store their bike in the bath, for example. Um, and and finally, working with TfL, that's the other important thing as, as a London borough to work with TfL um, to make sure that the, the transport options are available to all and, and that bus routes aren't cancelled and, and things like that. So a joined up approach. Thank you. Zoe Garbett, Green Party. Thanks, Lauren. Can I just check the question? It's about wider decarbonisation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, as we're the Green Party, this is absolutely what we want to take action on. We've repeatedly called for national urgent action on the climate crisis, and we're unlike the Labour Party, we're proud of people protesting about this being a climate emergency. We're proud of XR, and we're proud of the school strikers making making this, bringing this into people's forefront. So, yeah, you heard my comments on transport. We absolutely recognise that the climate emergency is a health emergency and the impact of that is being felt unequally by residents in our borough. So we will take urgent action on uh, improving air quality, but also improving the conditions of people's homes. So the council is responsible for a large number of people's homes, those council houses, and they want us to take to improve that stock so that they can make better choices around energy and reducing their energy bills, but also kind of saving saving money as well as saving the planet. We want to work with residents and listen to residents. People like Sustainable Hackney have been sidelined side by the council. Um, the climate summit recently was absolutely not a climate assembly and we would instate a climate assembly, work with experts and work with residents with a network of community panels and work with people in their own language to make sure this is inclusive as possible. Um, we would divent, I divest the pension fund from fossil fuels which lots of organisations are calling for locally, and I'd absolutely protect our green space, which we know, and our mature trees, which we know are essential in um, addressing the climate crisis. So I'd never build on green space. I'd never cut down mature trees. And we know that the construction industry is one of our most polluting. So we would own, I'd only use that to build council homes and things that we absolutely need and not to make money for developers. So if you do want a green, if you do want green action, then you do need to, to, you can vote green. Thank you. And finally, Philip Glanville, Labour and Cooperatives. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I would argue we're the only party that's serious about climate change and happening and actually taking the tough decisions. Any party that comes to a meeting like this and says we're proud to see the LTNs isn't serious about tackling safety, air pollution, or the transport contribution to climate change. Um, the question is about wider decarbonisation though. I was proud of declaring a climate emergency. I've stood with XR, I've stood with Sustainable Hackney. I really value Hackney Civic Society, that challenge to go faster and further around climate change is what makes Hackney so special. Uh, my manifesto that I've developed really has the principles of co-production at its heart, whether it's with residents, businesses, communities, organisations, and our climate action plan that we all bring back to the public for full consultation after the election will really be that kind of document. Uh, we're talking about a Green New Deal uh, that is doubling the size of Hackney's green economy. And people all, all too often talk about getting to net zero as something that's going to be negative and painful. It's going to make a change to our society. It's going to require a more circular economy, but it can also be a source of green and sustainable growth. And I think we've got all the ingredients in Hackney business, our skills, our colleges, our schools, a real passion from young and old to play a part in this. So growing that economy, creating opportunities is really important. And that's why retrofit is going to be vital. Uh, transport is one of those big contributions to climate change, but it's not the only one. How we heat our homes, our public buildings, 
I'm going to ensure that every school is net zero by 2030. We don't install another gas boiler in our own stock by 2026. That we bring forward those net zero retrofit pilots. We really take the fight to government and say, if you're serious about climate change, you must invest in retrofit and community energy. We can't see a restoration of fracking, big oil, the big six, that pendulum between nationalisation and privatisation that takes place at Westminster. We want to invest in more community energy. People like Stokey Energy, that I was proud to support, that got Mayor of London funding to install solar panels at Stoke Newington School and are really committed to uh, solar panels on our Hackney icons. We're going to use our assets to generate our own energy uh, through our energy company and sell that energy back through things like our EV infrastructure. Those LED lights as well, something that saves money if you make that investment. By the end of this year, all our streets will have LED lights. We want to take those same principles onto our estates and save our tenants and leaseholders their bills and improve lighting. Because actually lighting is about community safety. And one of the things that come through uh, is that. So social justice, health, climate change, labour values, pack and fuel property is everything that we will be uh, about. We're 100% renewable in terms of our electricity. We've got to move on into removing gas, as I said. And I want to see the energy assets of this borough either held in trust by the council for our communities or owned by the communities themselves. So a lot of the funding that we've done around green homes, around PV, solar infrastructure, our green planting, green infrastructure, green in the grey. Uh, I'm really proud of our record over the last four years, but I want to make the next four years about doing that with community. Uh, and taking some of the best uh, examples across London of where that's been done successfully, as well as some of those schemes like Nesbitt House uh, in Hackney, where we've had an energy co-op for a number of years. So I really see this as an opportunity to make a huge difference to the lives of Hackney residents, make that just transition and be even more... Sorry to interject, to interject, but I think, that, I think that's two minutes now. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll move on, sorry. Sorry, Philip, missed up the timing on that one. Okay, uh, thank you. We're moving on to the question around uh, children and young people again. So we're at Fernbank and Hillside Children's Centres have received a stay of execution from the council, but their long-term futures remain unclear. How would you protect subsidised early years care? And if you plan to keep children's centres open, how would you finance this? And we'll start off with Gwenton Slowly from Hackney People Before Profit. Thank you for letting me go first on this. This is my area of expertise, one uh, specialising in work of young people in Hackney for the past 16 years. We have had a football team, just an example, working down at the Mabley Green where we are struggling to actually secure the funding to keep the football team going. We also had young people that was out, out of school, excluded, or for some reason they were too dangerous to attend the Prue, attending a school that we built in Hackney Marshes. And again, because of funding, we had to close that school down. In the first time in the history of this country, we've had 50 young people taken to the Goffier Cup in Austria, three years in a row, all self-funded. And blessings to the speaker of Hackney who has supported us throughout that process that we've been struggling. And that is over a hundred young people that attend Mabley Green each week that are struggling to even play on a football pitch. And, and if we look at the cost of each murder, three point something million, because it's gone up now, before it was 1.8 million, each time someone's murdered, uh, the pocket has to be open to investigate that murder. Why is that money not being invested into these young people that are trying to keep themselves safe and engage in some positive activity? Then the final point is, you ask where the money comes from. The POCA fund, the Proceeds of Crimes Act money. 30 seconds. Yeah, if we listen to what the commissioner said last year, with the act of the INCRO chat being targeted, they recovered millions just in Forest Hill and Lewisham alone. They found £53 million in one person's house. So why is that money not being reinvested back into helping young people? Thank you. We'll move on to Helen Baxter from the Liberal Democrats. As mayor, the first thing that I would do on day one is to ensure the future of Fernbank and Hillside and, and take them out of the state of limbo that they're currently in, not, not knowing whether they've got a future or not. Um, childcare is, is absolutely vital. Subsidised childcare is, 
is crucial to our borough. I would not only protect those places, I'd protect all subsidised childcare and in fact increase the provision. It's about priorities and this would be my number one priority. Um, the cost of living crisis is, is, is just beginning and, and it's heartbreaking to already hear stories of people foregoing meals to, to, um, to provide for, for, for their children and to ensure they can afford childcare, which is in some cases is as, as high as housing costs. Um, it would be my number one priority. Thank you. We move on to Zoe Garbett from the Green Party. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a really important topic and absolutely something that I is really close to my heart. I've, I've worked in the public sector for over 10 years and part of that has been in children's services. And I know how important this kind of provision is to families. I also met with 4 in 10, the Child Poverty Network, who have, and I'm absolutely committed to a child child poverty free city and how Hackney plays its part in that um, and we know from the research they've done that one of the biggest causes of poverty is the is a unavailable and inaccessible for, like affordable childcare so protecting Fernbank and other childcare provision is it would be an absolute priority and it would be difficult to make that decision around finances as I said I've worked in the public sector and had to make some of those difficult decisions around um, how we use budgets but the Green Party absolutely invested in children and young people and, you know, the, and the importance of early years. Um, a lot of our policy is grounded in um, yeah, prevention and investing in families. As Helen just highlighted, we're in a cost of living crisis and I'm absolutely committed to doing all I can as mayor to address that with residents. I committed today to um, reduce um, eliminating council tax for those for poorest for those who for our poorest and funding that through those who can pay paying more um yeah there's and yeah there's other ways that we can work with and talk to families about the things that they need and prioritizing those within the decisions that we make thank you we move on to philip blandell labor and cooperatives thanks lauren i, I think when you're mayor you have to take difficult decisions, but you also have to know when you've got something wrong and change course. And um, taking that decision last November uh, around these two children's centres was absolutely right. And then taking the time to talk to parents, to visit those centres and understand why they're so special is something that I've also done uh, in the last couple of months. It's really clear to me that when you talk to parents, it's about affordable childcare. And the reassurances we could offer around early help and some of the universal services and some of the really targeted services um, were important, but that wasn't the primary uh, motivation of that campaign. It was around that access to inclusive, affordable childcare close to where they live and actually people coming from quite a long way to access it. So I'm not going to say that I can guarantee anything uh, about our, our children's centres and our early years uh, through this election campaign because budgets are incredibly difficult and tight. But what I will say is we're going to have a commission around affordable childcare. We're going to play SEND uh, at the heart of everything that we do uh, around our children's centres and assessment. So really making use of those opportunities in early years. I think one of the things that has been completely missing from this debate is we spend more than any other borough on our children's centres in London. That is how strong our commitment is around early years. And it's matched by youth services. Um, ourselves, Islington and Camden, Jossel, I think uh, in reports actually produced by Sean Berry at City Hall, for who invests the most in youth services in London. And I'm really proud to be in that top three. We've opened the new Hackney Youth Hub uh, in Hackney Wick, uh, based around sport. We've maintained our adventure playgrounds, we've invested in play, we've become a child-friendly borough. So connecting all of that together to make sure, uh, as we say in our manifesto, that this will be the best place to grow up and it will be an inclusive place to grow up with our early years, our schools, and our youth offer uh, is something I'm 100% committed to and making sure affordable childcare for all of the social equity and cost of living reasons is important to me as well. And we're going to end holiday okay, hunger you. and make sure we invest more in our CTRS scheme. Okay, thank you. we we'll move on to Oliver Hall from Conservatives. Thank you. I, I'd start by saying that I completely agree with what Helen said. Um, it's absolutely vital that working families have access to affordable childcare. And the first thing uh, that any mayor should want to do is safeguard the future of those affordable childcare centres. I know that growing up, it was incredibly uh, important and invaluable 
to my parents uh, that there were youth centres and there were um, after school clubs and that there were um, nurseries and things like that available uh, for myself and my siblings. So I think that that's, that's really, really important. And it's important that um, we don't just sort of pretend that this is an issue that doesn't really affect everyone. It does. It, it, it will guarantee our future. If we invest in this, it will guarantee our future. Um, and right now, we should be supporting those families, especially during this cost of living crisis. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to our question about health. Um, and this specific question is relating to health. What would you do as mayor to help Hackney recover from the pandemic? And we'll start off with Helen Baxter, Liberal Democrats. Everyone in Hackney has had a tough two years um, in this pandemic. Um, one concern that, that I have is that we still have a low, um, a low vaccinated population. Um, so one thing, in order to recover from COVID, we must make sure that, um, that people are protected from COVID. So one thing I would do is an outreach programme to communities with a low vaccination rate and get people in those communities talking, talking to people. Um, but in terms of um, support for businesses, high streets have suffered um, and something that the, the mayor does have power over is, is, is perhaps widening pavements to make high streets a more pleasurable place to go to. There were some changes in the roads during COVID, so it's now time to reassess those. Um, and mental health support is also really, really important, particularly for young people, although I think everyone's mental health has suffered in the pandemic. But ensuring there are mental health first aiders in schools, ensuring that... Um, we, have, we provide what, what youth, youth club provision that we can. Um, it's important that, that young people feel they're being listened to. Um, so I think they've, they've suffered most. OK, thank you. We move on to Zoe Garbett from the Green Party. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a really difficult couple of years for everybody, hasn't it? The, um, I work in the NHS and during the first wave of the pandemic um, supported the pandemic effort in providing the provision we needed for people experiencing homelessness and people seeking asylum. So that was making sure that they had the wraparound health provision they needed when they were placed in hotels in the boroughs that I worked in. Um, and I think that's the absolute headline message that we've kind of brought to the forefront, the absolute inequality that we've got in our in our communities. Um, and I think addressing that as a priority as we continue to recover from this pandemic would be my absolute priority. So working with communities, we've learned the absolute huge effort of the voluntary sector and of unpaid carers who, and so they'd be an absolute priority in any, any recovery that I'd be leading. Um, I think that, that yeah, the, the job that I do currently is to address health inequalities. I listen to residents and take their the you know the things that they think important up to executive directors within the NHS to make sure that the health provision we're providing is accessible and it's providing the provision that everybody needs and I think that's the real drive home message so looking at everything the council does and making sure that it's absolutely accessible and that we're not leaving anyone behind um, as Helen Ray raised the that's again the vaccination program but making sure that that's people experiencing homelessness people seeking asylum and you know people of colour who have found engaging with you know the support that they need you know it hasn't been the support that that they need um also we kind of found the value of green space during the pandemic and our neighborhoods so investing in green space and supporting communities to continue to kind of thrive together it's an absolute priority of mine as well thank you thank you philip glanville labor and cooperatives oh, sorry lauren can you repeat the question Yes. What would you do as mayor to help Hackney recover from the pandemic? But it is in the health category. Yeah, I'm going to focus on health because I think that's probably the really important thing uh, here that people are asking about. So one of the lessons that I definitely came out of the pandemic was the importance of community, listening to communities and allowing communities and supporting communities to respond, uh, whether it was around that humanitarian response and that could have been mutual aid, uh, the vaccine volunteers that I was really proud to be a part of. Uh, Hackney Vax Pack, the work the Volunteer Centre, Hackney HCBS uh, and others done and how that glue between Hackney Civic Society, the Council and the Health Service got us through uh, the pandemic and fundamentally saved lives. I think we have to take those lessons into recovery. We've done some really good pieces of co-production as a council while I've been there. We've got the Ageing Well strategy, which was co-produced with our older people. We've had Hackney Young Futures 
listening to young people's voice, the intergenerational stuff that those two uh, commissions uh, now want to deliver, I think can be really excited to be more inclusive uh, borough. The health champions that help lead some of the vaccine uh, and health advice into our communities. Uh, I think we need to build on that, on that wider piece around inclusive public health. But we also know there are some deep and entrenched health inequalities. So building on mental health first aid, uh, I'm lead Thrive London uh, with Jackie Dyer. I want to bring Black Thrive home uh, to Hackney, uh, ensure that we take some of the very best of practice around community mental health, public mental health, uh, and, and deliver that in our communities. Because prevention is ultimately uh, what makes people healthier and keeps them away from the second. end of the NHS. Uh, we have to, I think, rebuild the things that really matter in our communities, whether it's a lunch club, access to GPs, face-to-face. -face. There's a lot that's been lost as things have been digitised and people have been trying to keep COVID safe. And if we're to be really true to those prevention principles of working with our communities, we need to bring that work back and put our communities to its heart. And that is how we take those difficult lessons, we reduce inequality, and we work with people in new ways. Thank you. Oliver Hall, Conservatives. Thank you. I think that I'd start by saying that um, what we've seen from the pandemic is that we've all come out of this with a far stronger sense of community, I think. Uh, I was also a, a volunteer vaccinator with St John Ambulance, I still am. Uh, during the first wave of the pandemic, um, I was uh, a community responder with the Royal Voluntary Service around London uh, and Hackney. Um, these things are really important and we need to make use of that. We need to make sure that people um, who want to do that, to volunteer for their community, have that option. Um, as, we, as we come out of COVID, I think that um, making sure that making making sure that people in Hackney are healthy is an absolute priority. Uh, giving people the means to travel if they have disabilities, and supporting those struggling with health conditions um, is really important. We need to make sure that Hackney is open to all. And unfortunately, what we've seen over the last eighteen months, uh, two years, is that political decisions. Uh, both within City Hall and within Hackney Town Hall have exacerbated uh, the situation for a lot of people. Dis uh, other decisions could have been made, other routes could have been taken to ensure that people still had those opportunities to get out into their community when it was safe to do so. Um, and that simply uh, has been un undercut by, uh, by political decisions. So I think reversing those political decisions, ensuring that we listen to people and ensuring that we put them first as we recover from COVID is, is the most important thing. Thank you. And Gwenton Slowly, Hackney People Before Profit. Yeah, as someone that has been delivering training throughout the pandemic online via Zoom, and now as recently as last week, we had a graduation uh, down in Hackney Road for a group of young people that have been struggling with their mental health. The week before that, we was in Mably Green with two football teams that actually said no one's ever spoke to them about mental health and anxiety and how they've coped being told to go back outside. And if we look at current affairs, what's happening within the news, where we're seeing politicians not respecting people when they were actually isolating amongst other things, we have to bring that trust back. And I think that's the first thing uh, the next mayor needs to do is draw a line in the sand and say, look, whatever's happened before, th this is time for change because we can't have politicians where at Central, they're playing games with people's lives and having discos and other things and having cake parties. And then we're going to be looking at their local representative and think that they're any different. So we need to build back the trust within the community and not just wanting to be career politicians and become famous, but actually putting the people first and actually understand that a lot of people have suffered throughout these two years. I lost a lot of friends to suicide and other things, people that I thought were strong had given up throughout the lockdown. And, and I'm talking Hackney residents where we've had funerals. And for those of you that don't know what a nine night is, that's nine nights after someone's passed away. So as we're there at one nine night, there's another because someone has actually given up. So we need to give back hope to the normal residents and let them know that as politicians, you know, different to them, we're all hurting together. Yeah, bring back the love in the community. Thank you. 
Okay, so moving on to a question around housing again. How would you improve systems for tackling dilapidation, such as mould, damp and sewage leaks in council housing? This time we'll start with Zoe Garbett from the Green Party. I'm sorry, what was the first bit of the question? You said improve. How would you improve systems for tackling dilapidation in council housing? OK. Um, so first of all, yeah, I hear about this a lot on the doorstep as well as on my estate. I work really closely with um, the Hackney repairs team, but we've recently put in a complaint about how the repairs team have failed to listen to the residents and we feel like Hackney as a landlord has failed the most vulnerable residents on our estate by not being able to respond to their issues quickly. We've had people left without um, hot water in the winter months with the disabled young person. And it's absolutely those processes that we need to improve. We need a better way for families to be able to communicate that they're in urgent need and for that urgent need to be um, responded to. So I think in terms of the systems, I'd make sure that families families and residents are able to access the support that they need that it's respected as an emergency when it's communicated as an emergency i yeah fund and put, put funding into improving the quality of homes and making sure that their their stock is maintained um and yeah just make sure that we're um listening to listening and responding to the needs of people in you know, lots of people on the estate tell me that they feel like second class citizens. And I think it's one of the most, you know, sad things that I hear. And I think that would be my absolute priority to address. Thank you. Moving on to Philip Glanville, Labour and Cooperatives. I, I, I would start by apologising to anyone watching this that has been through challenges around repairs in our council stock. Um, I recognise the, the challenge. Uh, I've seen some of those flats myself. I knock on doors, I listen to people, and it hasn't been good enough. Two reasons for that. We've had uh, COVID, where we've only been able to do emergency repairs. We've also had the cyber attack that's impacted some of our systems. Those two things interacting really knock the, tr the trust and confidence, I think, of our uh, residents uh, and tenants and leaseholders. We've also not been able to do the walkabouts with our tenants in the ways that we would want to. Uh, I know that it's really important as well to have active TRAs on our estates, holding us to account. In some places, they've made the transition online really well. In others, not so good. So it's about rebuilding trust and rebuilding the systems that will make this work. We've already started to commit to a turnaround plan. It's a million pounds investment into repairs. We've had a really great track record of insourcing services in housing services and across the council. That increases quality, improves terms and conditions and also increases the skills of our workforce. So we've been hiring more people, uh, gas fitters, plumbers, carpenters, general trades, more people into our contact centre from Hackney that understand the issues and respect our tenants uh, and want to make a difference. Uh, that is going to help clear the backlog. We're going to have a 24-hour leak protocol where we respond to all leaks within 24 hours. That is absolutely vital to getting this right, and it's also right that we look at heating and seconds. those things around our vulnerable residents. Uh, over the long term, I want to uh, make sure that when we go out there and do the big investment, that we link that with what our data and our residents are saying around their priorities. One of the challenges of the Decent Homes programme that improved a lot of our estates is they left water infrastructure untouched. So we were plugging new kitchens and bathrooms into historic water infrastructure. We're going to have to right that wrong in this generation of investment and link that to retrofit and creating the warm homes that will keep our families safe and healthy in the future. Thank you. Oliver Hall, Conservatives. Thank you. I think the first thing that I would say is that I don't think an apology from the current mayor cuts it, really. Um, too many people have been waiting far too long. And he can use COVID as an, as an excuse, but really what, what qualifies as an emergency repair? Because as I previously mentioned, I mean, there was the case of the lady who's been waiting six months because her ceiling has collapsed in. How is that not an emergency? Why aren't, why isn't the council triaging in a more appropriate way uh, for these cases? Um, the heating and power outage in Shoreditch last year and, and this year because of, uh, well, because of a variety of reasons, but during some of the coldest days uh, on record it, it is really unfair. Um, and the response from the council was simply not good enough because it kept happening. 
and it might well happen again this year if they don't uh, work hard to future-proof it. I'll go back to the issue of uh, the hacking uh, because I think that's really important. The online systems aren't working. I speak to people every day who have complained online about an issue on their estate or an issue in their flat, and they just don't get a response. And then they phone up and they spend hours on hold. I myself was on hold for two hours the other day trying to talk about council tax to somebody. Uh, I know that people have been on hold for much longer than that. Um, people simply don't have the time to call, so don't don't bother after trying once or twice. Um, people are being left behind. And what we need is a, is a political will to actually listen to them and do better. And we haven't got that from the current uh, administration. And we, we won't get it if they're re-elected. They, we need some political will here in Hackney to listen to the people who count and listen to the people uh, who have these issues. So that's what I would do as your mayor. I would listen I would take uh, everything you're saying on board and I would reform the way that Hackney Service Centre listens uh, or triages your case so that you actually get the service that you uh, you deserve. Thank you. Brenton Slowly, Hackney People Before Profit. Yeah, I echo uh, the, the same concerns. If we are unable to fix the mess that's already there, and you've been there long enough, to fix the mess, what is going to change having another term in office? More of the same. And the people, as I said, I've met a number of families that are struggling to even have their case be heard. We've had to take to the MPs. We've had mothers go as far as stealing nappies just to get into the Hackney Gazette so their voices could be heard. So these are extreme measures, and it's not just... An isolated case, as Oliver said, when you're out in the community and people know that they could approach you for support, the number of emails that are right to the MPs and the local council screaming for help is unbelievable. And the timescales, some of them haven't even responded. And this is one of the reasons why I decided to run, to take a stand, to remind Philip and others that normal people like myself and residents that are not interested in being career politicians are willing to stand against you, to remind you that enough's enough. I'm not a member of one of the main parties, even though you've invited me over there many times, because I want you to do better. It's time for change. And if you're not gonna listen to the people's votes, you are actually taking the people's votes for granted. And I'm going to end on that point. Thank you. Helen Baxter, Liberal Democrats. The mayor talks about rebuilding trust following the cyber attack. It's hard to see how he'll, he can rebuild trust when he won't even make the details of what happened public. We, the Hackney Liberal Democrats, submitted a Freedom of Information request in December 2020. We didn't hear anything back. And the Information Commissioner's Office is now starting contempt of court proceedings. So it's disappointing to, to hear from the mayor that he won't he won't make those details public. Um, but to, to get back to the question, it's shocking the conditions that some people are living in in Hackney in the 21st century. Um, we must enforce inspections, um, and when an ins inspection has happened, ensure that that the issues identified are followed up on and actually ensure that, for example, when a safety inspection takes place, that the safety report is then made available to residents. So the residents actually, in an open and transparent way, can see what's what's happening in the buildings that they, they're living in rather than just being taken for granted and treated like second class citizens. Thank you. OK, we're moving on to our eighth question. Um, I just want to remind people that these are questions that have been raised by readers, so they're not coming from Hackney Citizen themselves. So I'm just going to read it out exactly as it has been asked. Women are extremely concerned their female-only spaces are at risk from biological males. We do not want to share our spaces in sport, prisons, etc. And why are we having to argue this point? Who will hashtag respect my sex by my X chromosome? Why are we being treated this way? I'm going to start off with Philip Landall from Labour and Cooperatives. Look, I'm going to start that globally and in the UK, trans people are some of the most vulnerable people in our society. They have the weakest set of legal rights supporting them. 
that are most at risk of suicide, sexual exploitation, domestic abuse. And if you add in intersectionality to that as well, talk about people that are black and trans, they're more likely to die earlier than any of us on this panel. So I do think we have to start with that vulnerability and respect people's rights and not reduce this to a zero sum game. You can have women's only spaces. You can really respect the feminist movement without attacking uh, trans people, whether they're transitioning, uh, whether they're questioning their identity, whether they're gender neutral or other things. I'm really proud of our record in Hackney of listening to trans people, listening to women, protecting those spaces that need to be protected, but also making those spaces inclusive where we can uh, without affecting other people's rights. And I think some of the debate online is frankly disgusting. Um, and it is, uh, it is uh, really, uh, I think, some of the worst aspects of political debate and activism in this country. And then sort of saying that our children safe from trans people. You know, some of the emails that are going around from these campaign groups remind me of Section 28. And can you trust a gay teacher in a changing room? It is frankly disgusting. It's beneath this movement. And we can do more around violence against women and girls. I'm really proud of the consultation we have done around that, holding the police to account, holding ourselves to account, thinking about domestic abuse services. But if we make it about attacking minority groups and some of the most vulnerable minority groups, I think we're missing uh, the point. And talk to Hackney trans young people, uh, as I have done over every year that I have been there. Listen to their stories. Uh, they're intersectional, they involve people with disability. Uh, and to frame the debate in this way, I think it's utterly, utterly wrong. Thank you, Philip. Oliver Hall, Conservatives. Thank you. I, really, I would echo everything that the Mayor, uh, Phil, Philip, has just said. Uh, absolutely everything. I, I, too, am concerned that the way that some of the discourse um, is going uh, takes back to a time 20, 30 years ago, um, where that discourse was instead happening about gay people. Um, I think that for too long we've ignored uh, on all sides, the issue of violence against trans people. Um, and we absolutely, we can, we can do both. We can protect trans people and we can uh, protect women. Um, there isn't, it isn't a zero sum game. It, it's not one or the other. We can do both and we need to do both. Uh, and that's all I really have to say. Thank you. Wenton Slowly, Hackney People Before Profit. I think we need to take a stance on this where, as the mayor, you include everyone. No one's excluded. And zero tolerance to hate crime, first and foremost, because my stance on this is we've all got one life and we should all live a happy life. No one should feel as if they're living in a community where they're living in fear of persecution, whether because of your colour whether because of your sex or any of our protective characteristics then makes you vulnerable because there's no protection there. And it needs to be open support, more support to minority groups which are feeling like they're being isolated and suffering in silence. So my thing is unity. We're all one people. We're all one community. And we need to bring that love back. And if you're the mayor, you need to show inclusiveness, not excluding others and making them feel as if their voice is not being heard. Thank you. Helen Baxter, Liberal Democrat. Um, I absolutely agree that we should listen to, to all voices. And um, this, is, this debate has become very toxic. I think you often only hear the most extreme voices. I think as politicians, one of our jobs is to create the conditions for an open, respectful, mature debate where everyone can give their opinion and be listened to and, and respected. So that's that's what I'd start with. I, I think the question was about single sex spaces. Um, while I think that um, for many people, their gender identity um, is, is different to their sex and that must always be respected. I think there are some cases where, where, um, where single sex spaces are really important and where sex takes priority. For example, um, um, for example, in, in health, in, health um, in sport, um, and thinking about perhaps some of the religious groups in our borough, there are some, some circumstances where single-sex spaces are, are appropriate. Um, 
but as I say, I'd, I'd, I'd love us to be able to have a really open, mature debate on this topic. Thank you. And Zoe Garbett, Green Party. Thank you. Um, I must say I completely agree with Phil. And I'm sorry, Helen, it's not a debate. It's about people's, it was about people's rights and protecting people's rights. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Phil that this is, we're about the inclusive borough. The Green Party respects that trans women are women and trans men are men. And that's absolutely the leadership that I would give this borough. We don't need to debate people's rights. I think it's really clear that we need to, absolutely, as Phil was saying, this is a minority group of people who who have suffered extreme harassment and, you know, extreme terrible situation, uh, terrible circumstances. And I think, yeah, we need to just stand really up against this narrative. Um, yeah. Thank you all. OK, we're going to ask a final question. What sets you apart from other candidates? We'll start off with Oliver Hall from the Conservatives. I think what sets me apart is that, well, I think there are a few things. Um, first of all, that I, I represent change, and that's a difference to what the Labour Party represent here in Hackney. The Labour Party, as I said earlier, have been uh, in control of the council, uh, and they've had the mayoralty since its inception in 2002, but they've been in, in control of the council for 51 years. And during that time, they've become too comfortable. Now, the Conservative Party was uh, placed second uh, in 2018, in the mayoral race in 2018. Um, what we need is uh, for people to get out there and vote for change, because by voting Labour, you won't be voting for change. Um, over the last four years, uh, your council tax has gone up by 17%. And this year it's gone up by 3% or 2.99%, despite the cost of living crisis. Now that was to raise £2.7 million this year for the council. But the Taxpayers Alliance uh, last week published their uh, town hall rich list. And what that found was that 36 people in Hackney Borough Council earn over £100,000. That's the third highest in the country. There isn't an excuse for that. It's not in line with the uh, with what the market is paying. Um, even the mayor's own salary isn't in line with what the market pays. The leader of Islington Council gets half what he gets paid. The mayor of the West Midlands uh, controls an authority with far more power and ten times the uh, population, and they and they get paid six grand less than him. So what I would do, first of all, is get rid of the overpaid people. That would raise four point eight million pounds for the council. And what, we, what else we need to do is cut the mayor's salary because it isn't fair that people are struggling to put food on their table, making the decision between heating or eating um, while he earns that much or while whoever the mayor is earns that much. It isn't fair and we need a more community focused mayor and that's what I'll be. Thank you. Gwenton Slowly, Hackney People Before Profit. Yeah, we'll first start off by being transparent and actually calling out corruption and, and actually telling the truth, as we've seen the current mayor has not been able to do or refusing to do, especially with him being held ransom by these online gangster hackers uh, currently still holding the council to ransom, which is impacting on everyone else's life. For me, I'm not trying to be a career politician. If so, I would have joined one of the main parties. I am here to take a stand. Uh, I've run two elections in two of our to in another borough and the people demanded I come back home. As you know, I'm someone that I've grown up in Hackney. Uh, out of 40 friends, I'm the only one still here. The rest of them are probably on hard drugs or in jail or some of them dead. So for me, this is not just about playing party politics with the people. It starts off by raising awareness. I run a business that is very successful. So also it's not about the money. And I agree with you, Oliver. There's no need for a mayor to be getting paid that salary. And if I become the mayor, I will be donating some of that salary to organisations such as the ones I mentioned down in Mably Green and some of the food banks in the area. And these are the initiatives that we need to see our mayor doing and taking a stand. Give back some of your own funds and stop making excuses of why a lot of these youth provisions are actually disappearing when uh, we, there's no justification for that amount of uh, salary. And that we need to look at the impact of this current war, unwanted war, 
and the rise in energy bills and, and, and today I was driving around, no petrol stations were open. So we need to understand that things are only going to get worse. And if we vote these people back in, we're going to get more of the same. And what I'm saying to you out there is this, vote for someone that don't have to toe the party line and vote for right, someone. Right, and sorry and to interrupt. I think that's, that's two minutes now. Was. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to Helen Baxter, Liberal Democrats. The Liberal Democrats up and down the country have a strong record in local government working tireless for communities, and that's because we listen to people and fight for them. I believe that local people know what's best for their communities, and that's what make, would make me different. I would um, put decision-making power back in the hands of residents and listen to people from across the borough. Thank you. Zoe Garbett, Green Party. Thank you. Um, really interesting hearing everyone's answers. Um, so I, yeah, I absolutely love happiness. I'm sure that all the other candidates do, but I'm t and I'm totally embedded in my community. I think you've heard me mention lots of groups and organisations and the voluntary work that I do because I'm absolutely committed to fundamentally changing the relationship between residents and the council. And we heard at the Morning Lane People's Space meeting a couple of weeks ago about financing residents to kind of put forward their own community plans which I think is really exciting. I'm currently working with community leaders in Gillette Square about the of that space and I think that's that's the kind of leadership that I want to bring to the to the mayor um, the role of mayor. Um, you know, I'm also really focused on keeping wealth in Hackney so how we can kind of build that you know taking that community wealth building approach and kind of yeah investing in uh, local business like the work I've done on Ridley Road. Um, Thank you. I've also got pink hair. <laughs> it sets me apart. <laughs> uh, finally, Philip Glanville, Labour and Corporatist. I'd love to have pink hair, but that, that ship <laughs> sailed a long time ago and there are photos of me with blonde highlighted tips to prove that I did have hair. Um, I'm, I'm standing again, so uh, I'm really passionate about Hackney. I think all of the candidates have said that they love Hackney. That doesn't set us apart. What I would say that sets me apart is that I'm part of a team, 57 amazing Labour candidates standing for election. Uh, this is a team effort. We always have Meryl Hustings. But actually, it comes down to who you work with and how you give power away and work with our communities. And I'm really excited about having one of the most diverse teams uh, of Labour candidates standing with me. And it's that team that delivers uh, for Hackney. I think the Greens and Labour are the only two parties in the borough that are actually standing in every ward taking seriously our communities and listening to their voices. I think it's really disappointing other parties haven't been able to do that. And I think they're going to miss out uh, in taking that community voice, listening to people and bringing people together. There are 300 promises in my manifesto that were co-produced with Labour Party and Cooperative Party members. So if you also vote for me, you're not just voting for socialist Labour values, you cooperative values uh, as well. Two parties uh, firmly for the price of one. Uh, I'm passionate about Hackney. I've spent my entire adult life nearly in this borough, uh, working, being a councillor, uh, being uh, a really active uh, citizen and finally getting the honour to stand up from there. I've never wanted to do any other job in politics. I'm not interested in Westminster. It isn't something as a stepping stone to somewhere else. Uh, this is a place that I fundamentally believe in and it'd be an absolute honour to be re-elected uh, as your mayor. We have some amazing ideas in that manifesto. It's on climate, housing, building a more inclusive economy and fundamentally giving more power away. One of the first things I did as mayor, if you look at the scheme of delegation that governs what the mayor can do, is give those powers to cabinet and to council and then setting up those big discussions, whether it's Hackney Young Futures Commission, Dalston, Hackney Central Conversations. I want to do even more of that if I am re-elected. And again, I think all of us are passionate about Hackney and I really look forward to continuing this debate in the next hustings. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we did promise you all a final one minute uh, closing statement, which but, um, if you feel like you've already said what you want to say, you don't need to. Um, so we, but I'll give you the opportunity anyway. Uh, we can start off with Gwenton Slowly from Hackney People Before Profit. Yeah, my final statement is going to be short and sweet. And it's as simple as this. Vote the same and you get the same treatment. Don't complain. You've been given an alternative to vote for. Thank you and take care. Thank you, Gwenton. Helen Baxter, Liberal Democrats. 
as I just said, if um, as mayor, I would put decision-making power back in the hands of, of residents and would listen to people from across the borough. Um, my priorities would be supporting local families with the cost of living crisis, building truly affordable housing um, and making the borough safer for everyone. Um, the elections on the 5th of May are a chance for Hackney to show that they've had enough of Labour taking them for granted and to vote for a fresh start. Thank you. Zoe Garbett, Green Party. I'd just like to start by saying a huge thank you to the Hackney Citizen um, for these hustings and for your coverage of the local election and local politics all year round. It's really great to have like thriving local journalism. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who's attended, participated and asked questions. I'm really happy to continue people to follow me on Twitter or email me or go on my website, Zoe for Hackney, to continue asking questions. Really enjoyed sharing my green vision with you this evening. I can provide the leadership we need to address the connected issues of social and environmental injustice and inequality, especially during the cost of living and climate crisis. The Greens are standing candidates in all seats, um, and we are the main opposition party in Hackney by vote share in the local elections to get hardworking Green representatives onto the council to bring fresh ideas and accountability to the table, then please use all your votes to vote green on the 5th of May. If you want green, you need to vote green. And you've heard me talk about our urgent action action on the climate emergency, providing the homes we That's need. That's it, Zoe. Sorry. <laughs> OK, Philip Glanville, Labour and Cooperatives. Thank you for everything about uh, Hackney Citizen and the Hackney Gazette and what they bring to local democracy. And thank you for everyone that's attended this evening uh, and asked the question. This is democracy in action. Voting on the 5th of May helps define uh, the future of our borough. It's a really important moment. I've never taken the voters of Hoxton for granted when I was a local councillor or the voters of Hackney for granted when I've been uh, the mayoral candidate. I've already campaigned uh, in most of the wards in the borough. I've knocked on doors uh, from Stamford Hill to Shoreditch. It's really important we take residents' values, take their concerns, their hopes, their desires seriously. And I've done that in everything that I have done around politics. This is not more of the same. Absolutely not. Uh, we haven't talked about opportunity and inclusive economy much uh, during the questions, but you know the, the moral decisions we have taken to support things like London Living Wage, to in-source services, to create apprenticeships for not just young people, but older residents returning to the workplace. This borough is a more inclusive and fairer borough because it's had a Labour mayor that believes in those values. I want to do even more of that if Thank I'm re-elected. I also want to listen to people Thanks, in the campaign. Thank you. OK, finally, Oliver Hall, Conservatives. Thanks, and thanks to everyone who's uh, stuck it through the 90 minutes as well to, uh, to be here with us. Um, tonight you've heard that it isn't Labour's fault. That's what you've heard from them. Uh, whether it's waiting for repairs on your home or shutting your roads or cuts to public services, in their eyes, it's always someone else's fault. Well, you might have even been told by Labour councillors and Labour activists on the doorstep, I know that friends of mine have, that it doesn't matter who they vote for because Labour are going to get in anyway. That's what the councillors, that's what the Labour councillors have been saying. But that simply isn't true. Hackney needs change. After two years of COVID restrictions, it's time that we reopen Hackney and it's time that after 51 years of Labour uh, rule in Hackney that we get some change and you won't get that by voting. This election will be the most important in, in a generation. It will determine the future of our borough for decades to come and a Conservative administration in Hackney would put more money into your pocket, return lost services and invest in your future. So you have a choice at this election because actually it's the Conservative Party. Thanks Oliver, there. sorry. I have to make you stop. I'm really sorry. Okay, that's it for us. Uh, Max, did you want to close? Yes, thank you, everyone. I just want to say um, thank you to everyone for watching and uh, yeah, sticking it out to the end. Um, a, a huge thank you to our candidates for taking part uh, and also to Lauren for, for running things so smoothly. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I, I just want to quickly remind people that um, you need to register to vote by the midnight on the 14th of April if you're planning to vote in person uh, by 5pm on the 19th of April if you want to vote by post and if you want to vote by proxy you have until 5pm the 26th of April to register so uh, do make sure you use your vote uh, so yeah thank you everyone it's been uh, it's been a pleasure to have you all um, yeah good, good night thank you thank you